before there was the internet, before there was television, before radio, and even before the printing press, the human family had an oral storytelling tradition. Tribes and communities would have an elder who would have people gathered around and would tell stories. And those stories were handed down through generations. Today, you know, we, we might think that that's so ancient and so quaint, but the fact is the oral storytelling tradition has exploded again today through the use of technology. So one example is audiobooks, which have been witnessing double digit growth for the past several years. And it doesn't seem that that's going to curtail any time in the foreseeable future. So some market research analysts did some analysis and predicted that the global audiobook market is poised to grow at a compound annual rate of 24% from 2020 to 2027, which means that audiobooks will be a $15 billion industry by 2027. And it's not just audiobooks. We are also seeing podcasts and live talk shows taking more audience time. I mean, the new data that I came across that was reported by Axios shows that the share of audio consumed by people, and this is part of the good news, ages 13 and older, that young people are very much a part of this. People ages 13 and older in the United States have been consuming the spoken word in bigger numbers. I mean, it's increased by 40%. Their consumption of the spoken word has increased by 40% since 2014. And that would include podcasts, audiobooks, live talk shows, and so on. Meanwhile, the share of music has decreased by 8%, eight percentage points in that time. This data comes from NPR and Edison Research's latest annual spoken word report and it shows that uh, much of the growth of the spoken word audio um, is coming from, and again, here's the good news, outsized consumption by younger adults ages 13 to 34. That's a really positive thing for people who write books for a living because there was a lot of talk about how young people don't read anymore. In fact, young people read more than ever. Maybe young people are reading more than ever in history. Now, they're not always reading the things we want them to read. Um, but we're talking about audio. And the fact is that there are a lot of people, this is part of the issue that we face as an industry, that writers face as an industry. And that is that there are a lot of people out there who have a difficult time with reading. Their brain doesn't work that way. There's dyslexia. I mean, we all know about dyslexia, but there is, it's not just dys dyslexia. Some people's brains do not operate as well with the written word as it does with the spoken word. Now, stop and think about it. Some people are auditory, as in the ears. They're really good at listening. Some people are visual, whether it's with design or being able to read the written word. Some of us are tactile. Some of us are experiential. And this is one of the reasons why so many authors now are committed to the idea of getting their books, not just in print, but also audio format, because the audio format is, again, it's exploding and it actually looks like it may be poised, according to the reporting on this, to catch and even surpass ebooks or electronic books. Now, I happen to be a person who does a lot of audiobooks and, and for a very simple reason. I'm on a screen all day long as a magazine editor, and my eyes are pretty much it's not actually I want to say that my eyes are pretty much burned out, but it's really not that. The the issue is that 
I don't want to be in a chair the rest of the day after I've been working. And I do as much on my feet as I can uh, while I'm on the job. And what audiobooks allows us to do is take a ride in a car, take a walk, hiking, weightlifting, treadmill, cleaning the house, anything that you can do that doesn't require full mind share. And if you're good with audio, audiobooks can be can be a well, in my case it has in a lot of people's case cases, it has vastly increased the amount of information that they can consume or the amount of entertainment that they can consume. Is there a difference anymore between information and entertainment? To some degree, yeah. But when you stop and think about audiobooks, I know a lot of people who I'll bring up audiobooks to them and they'll say, you know, I've never really gotten into that. I haven't even really tried it. And I tell them it's not for everybody, but if you're good with listening, because just like some people have difficulty reading, some people also have difficulty listening while doing other things. There are people who say, well, I try doing audiobooks when I drive a car, but it, I'm just, I get too enmeshed in the story. So they're obviously good listeners, but it puts them at risk in a car. Obviously, you don't want to be doing that. The other thing I tell people, though, is that it's so important to have a good reader. And one person's good reader is another person's lousy reader. One of the things that you see a lot of is that there are authors out there who will read their own work. And in some cases, they're not really all that great at it. I mean, you take a guy like Paul Auster, A-U-S-T-E-R, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with him, he's definitely somebody you should become familiar with because he's a terrific novelist and he's quite prolific. He's not a great reader, but I prefer to listen to the books, his audio books, where he is the reader, even though he's not a great reader. The way he reads appeals to me. He knows where he wants to put the emphasis. He knows where he wants to put the inflections. And he doesn't even do a whole lot of, of inflecting vocally. He doesn't try to sound like a woman while he's reading or to try to uh, var uh, variegate the characters like some of your really outstanding readers will do. That's fine with me. It works for me. And there's something about the author who wrote the book knowing exactly where to put the emphasis knowing exactly what that listening experience should be like based on what he or she wrote. Now, one of the things that I notice Audible does, they tend to find the, a reader who sounds like the author, whose voice is similar to the author. And a lot of times this is a mistake because what ends up happening is the, the, the author doesn't have a particularly good voice and they end up with a reader that isn't, uh, isn't all that appealing. Of course, this is a personal opinion here. Now, just to further what I was saying about audio in the, the sweep of audiobooks, Spotify is getting into the business in a big way. You know, Spotify started as a music service, but now it's become a podcasting powerhouse. It just bought a company this month called Findaway. And Findaway operates a business called Voices that sets up authors with a narrator and ensures that the content gets made well, it's, that, that it's read well, that it's produced well. But in exchange, authors have to pay to make that happen by using their services paying for the service, but you get a better experience, I would imagine. You get a, a more polished product than say what Amazon offers, which is, or Audible, I should say, Audible slash Amazon offers, which is they give authors a service you can use to have somebody volunteer to read the book either in return for a share of proceeds residuals, or to be paid uh, to do that. A little different system. At least that's the way it was the last time I investigated it. Find a way is um, 
offering Spotify a really clear business opportunity because Spotify is once obviously what it's trying to do is become the one site that is dominant in terms of anything having to do with audio, really music, podcasts, audiobooks, and who knows where else they'll go with this. The other thing for me about audiobooks is that I really enjoy having somebody read to me. I like somebody telling me a story. And again, the the human family many, many you know, millennia ago got their stories, their tribes' stories, their society stories through that oral storytelling tradition. I think it's something that is fairly innate to human beings. We love being told stories. And of course, there's also the mobility aspect with, with audio. Ebooks offers mobility. I mean, you can take, what, dozens of books, ebooks on a vacation with you, but you can do the same with audio and you can be in motion with audio. You can be walking on the beach or what have you. So it's a big hit and it's a big opportunity for writers. Now, who really has sold the most in audio? During 2021, if you look in the notes section of this podcast, you will see that uh, I give you a list of the top 10 top selling audible audiobooks of 2021 of course audible is the is the 800 pound gorilla in the business and number one green lights by matthew mcconaughey which is really a memoir and he reads it himself in this case and number two is project hail mary uh, by andy ware if you remember andy ware is the guy who wrote the martian which was made into a major motion picture under the same name and um that starred Matt Damon. I went into that movie thinking, that without great expectations, that's just not my kind of movie most of the time, but I really enjoyed that movie and I think it had a lot to do with Matt Damon's performance, but it was a great concept by Andy Ware and now he's come out with a new one called Project Hail Mary. And the list goes on from there. I'll, I'm not gonna read through it, it's right there for you. So go ahead and take a look at that. So to me, audio works because, look, I'm a guy who likes to talk. I'm a guy who likes to listen to people talk. I don't think I'm that different than a lot of other people out there who like to be spoken to. It's almost like having company. I mean, there's a lot of times, I mean, you think about the number of people out there who are, they live alone. They live in, in some cases, even isolation and to have somebody talking to you, somebody telling you stories can be uh, perhaps in, in, in many cases less lonely than curling up with a book and communing in that way with the written word and, and uh, fiction writing, fiction reading. Now I can tell you what I don't like about audiobooks, at least the way Audible presents them they give you an audio clip so you can listen to the reader and you can make a decision on whether or not you like the reader's voice but they don't give you a big enough clip normally it's not any more than five minutes and you can't judge a book based on that so there's times when i've gotten audiobooks and then i wanted to return it and they can track how much you've listened to so they know that you haven't consumed that much. Audible will exchange books, but they they put the clamps on you pretty quickly and say you've already turned in uh, you know, your quotient of books. I'm a picky reader, I'm, I'm a picky listener. And I would much rather them be more flexible, either give a longer audio clip and make sure that it's not just the preamble or just introductory information from the author but actually get into the meat of the book so that you understand what you're getting what i would recommend is if you're wading into this area what you might want to do is go to the reading samples that you can find on goodreads or amazon books and take a look there and see if maybe do do some re reading ahead of time to try to figure out, is this really my style or not? 
because these books aren't cheap. They pay talent to come in and read them, unless, of course, the author reads them. But most of these are being read by professional writers, in some cases, even celebrities. You get a guy like Colin Firth, who read, I mean, you want a great audio book, um, The End of the Affair by Graham Greene about a love affair during World War II. Colin Firth reads the book spectacularly, of course. And you also get people like uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal and Jeremy Irons and so on. But there's also very popular and great readers whose names you've never heard of or who read an awful lot of those books for Audible. And they're very, very talented at that. So if you have not tried audiobooks, the reader is critical, but so is your lifestyle. I mean, where do you fit them in? You know, if you get War and Peace, you're committing to 60 some hours of listening time. If you get a Kurt Vonnegut book, you're generally looking at more like a seven or eight hour book. But typically, the most of the books I listen to run somewhere between 14 and 20 hours, which is fine with me. If you don't have the kind of lifestyle where you're going to have that kind of time to listen, if you don't take a nightly walk, if you're not good laying in bed at night and listening and maybe dozing off to your audio story. By the way, the the Audible player has a timer on it. You can say stop after five, uh, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15, 30 minutes, whatever, or even end of chapter. If you just let it run, then, you know, you're going to have to just find your way back to where you were. The app is very good. It's very good. So think about your lifestyle. Think about who that reader is. Think about authors who you like. And think about whether you're really more of a listener or a reader. I love to do both. Listening allows me to expand. Actually, if you're listening to this, you're probably a good listener. And you would be a very good candidate for audiobooks. Just don't deprive me of your listening time while you're doing that. You know, please continue to listen to my podcast while you expand your audio palette. I would appreciate that very much. This is my counsel for Novelist Spotlight, as always. Thank you for listening and good luck with your reading and writing.